Thank you, Madam President. Please, have a seat. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Denise, thanks for your leadership of this organization. You're right. I'm a county guy. You know, one of the things for real is that one of the things you learn when you start off, and I had the great honor of being a county council person in the Newcastle County. We have — we're like a miniature Illinois. We have — one county has about 60 percent of the state's population. So a county commissioner, a county council person, has a district that's, I think, seven times larger than a state rep and three times bigger than a state senator. What I learned early on, if you're in the county, you got to go through someone else to get help. You got to go to the governor. You got to go to your state legislature. You got to go to the state senators. And guess what? I stopped that. <laughs> no kidding. Because I'm telling you, you know, uh, one of the things that we expect people to do is we think that uh, people are like us, very familiar with all the detail of uh, is this working? Very familiar with all the detail of how government works. They don't know whether there's a pothole in, in, their, in their front and their, their side street, whether it's a county, a state, a, 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 they don't know who's responsible. And uh, they come to the county all the time. At least that was my experience in Newcastle County. And uh, when you don't have the same funding that you have for these other programs, you find that you're, you, you, you know, it's just hard. And uh, one of the things that I found out early on was we always did better when there was direct funding for the things that related to the county. I think it's one of the hardest jobs. No, I really mean it. I'm not being solicitous. I think it's one of the hardest jobs in politics. How many of you knocked on a door and say, my name's so-and-so, I'm running for county commissioner, and look at you and go, oh, um, uh, yeah, um, you wonder what the county commissioner does, aren't you? <laughs> well, yeah. So, I, no, I, I sincerely mean it. And so I want to thank, begin by thanking you all for what you do. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I uh, ran for the United States Senate because being in the county council was too hard. Um, <laughs> look, uh, I'm glad to be here with all of you. Before I begin, I want to take a moment to say our, our hearts are with the students and the families of Michigan State University. Last night, I spoke with Governor Whitmer, and uh, the FBI and the additional federal law enforcement are on the ground assisting the state and local folks. And, uh, Three lives have been lost and five seriously injured. And it's a family's worst nightmare. It's happening far too often in this country. Far too often. While we gather more information, there's one thing we do know to be true. We have to do something to stop gun violence ripping apart our communities. <laughs> ripping apart. And today marks five years, five years to the day that 14 students and three educators lost their lives in Parkland, Florida. I met every one of those families, spent time with them all. And uh, a lot of you here have to confront violence in your communities every single day. We took a big step toward passing the most significant bipartisan gun legislation in 30 years, ghost guns and other things, background checks, but there's a lot more work to do, and uh, I'm committing to getting it done with all of you. Some of you know I, that, uh, and I'm going to say something that's always controversial, but there is no rationale for assault weapons and magazines that hold 50, 70 bullets. We got it done once. We're going to do it again. But anyway, look, the, uh, some of you know, uh, as I s said, I started as a councilman in Delaware, and uh, the county executive in Newcastle County is here today, Matt Meyer. Matt, where are you sitting? <laughs> Matt's, Matt's hiding because, you know, how good, I'm a kid, Matt. <laughs> good to see you, pal. 
And uh, Matt knows uh, what I'm talking about. When people have a problem, they, uh, they've got your number, they knock on your door. Not only you, but your spouses can't go to the grocery store, the gas station, can't show up at the, without, well, what's a, can you fix my such and such? Well, I've always had enormous respect for the job you do. You, uh, you're the ones who make people, uh, make sure everything gets fixed. The library stay open late so kids can do their homework. The sewer system is backing up the, into the creek and, the, and their basements, so you make sure that your public health department runs smoothly, that your communities are meeting the needs and growing and changing populations, that, that your residents have access to affordable housing, that you're investing in public safety. There are huge responsibilities you have. They touch every aspect of people's lives. And when your constituents call needing help, with a, with a state problem or a city problem, uh, you take the call and you, you get it done. You end up calling to make sure you find out how to get it done. Simply put, you get things done. You're used to getting things done, fixing problems. And that's because you know the measure of success isn't how partisan points are scored, but it's how you fix the problem. Can you fix the problem, whether you're a Democrat, Republican, or independent? We're often told that Democrats and Republicans can't work together. And, uh, you know, there's always been competition, but in the last uh, 10, 12 years, it's been particularly tough. But as I told my friends in Congress in my State of the Union address last week, I believe people sent us a clear message in this off-year election. Fighting for the sake of fighting gets us nowhere. We're here to get things done. That's why we got, re that's why we got elected. It's always been my vision, and I really mean it. it's always been my vision, and I know it's yours as well. Over the past two years, we've been delivering on that vision. When I came to office, the pandemic was raging and our economy was reeling. But together we acted. Less than two months after we took office, the American Rescue Plan led to the fastest economic recovery of any major economy in the world. And I know that at the beginning of the crisis, like you did, that strengthening state and local governments was the key to our recovery. But when the CARE Act was passed before that, before I was, came into office, just before it, under the previous administration, some of you had to go to your state legislatures to get permission to use the money that was in the act. I used to be, that, uh, I used to be in your shoes. Only 120 counties in the United States of America got help in that CARES Act. There was a lot of money, but only 20, 120 counties. When I signed the American Rescue Plan, it sent $350 billion for the first time in history to every state, city, and county in America. We made sure all of you, over 3,000 counties, got direct funding because I know we empower you directly. You get the job done. 3,000 counties. That money helps show up your budgets, avoid painful layoffs, put cops back in the beat, firefighters back in the job, teachers in the classroom, nurses in the emergency rooms. And it worked. Since then, because of you, we've created 12 and a half, 12 million jobs, just a half a million alone, last month alone. And we've now created more jobs in two years than any administration ever created in a four-year term. And folks, the unemployment rate is 3.4 percent at a 50-year low. We've seen record small business applications. And by the way, every time someone makes an application for a small business, that's hope. It's hope, expressing they got hope they can get something done. We urge you to use the rescue plan money to make com community communities safer. Invest in affordable housing. Get small businesses back on their feet. Train your workforce, and you did. In Travis County, Texas, in Pierce County, State of Washington, you're addressing homelessness by increasing affordable housing stock, partnering with nonprofits to get the root, get the root of the problem. Ramsey County, Minnesota, in Ramsey County, Minnesota, is addressing worker shortages in child care and health care by training residents to become nurses and licensed child care professionals. The American Rescue Plan also provided $12 billion to address mental health needs arising from the pandemic. I know that addressing mental health is a priority for so many of you in this organization. And by the way, one of the things that I wrote down, I had lunch with the vice president today, and I keep little note cards about what I think we have to do. And I said, 
we have to pass legislation on the damaging technology that's having an effect on our kids. We've got to change the way the Internet works and the way people can, are able to use our children. It's got to stop. <laughs> Milwaukee County is using rescue funds to mentor kids involved in the criminal justice system. L.A. County is offering job training for kids with vulnerable populations. With the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, the most significant gun safety legislation in 30 years, we're providing another $10 billion to prevent violence and, threat and, and threats resulting in human trauma. Two billion of that is for your young people in particular to pay for things like school counselors. And as part of the unity agenda in the State of the Union, I call for a surge in resources to deal with fentanyl, the fentanyl epi epi epidemic that I know is devastating many of your communities. <clears throat> we now have a record number of personnel working to secure the border. We've now seized over 23,000 pounds of fentanyl just in the last several months. But if we're going to have the strongest economy in the world, we have to have the strongest and best infrastructure in the world. We used to be number one in the world. Now we're, number, we're moving to number 14. And China used to be number, I think, 10 or 11. Now they're number two. Folks, that's why I asked Congress to pass the Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment Act, larger than any investment made in infrastructure since Eisenhower's interstate highway system. A number of Republicans came together with Democrats to help us get it passed. And we're rebuilding the, the, the country through the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. In your counties, we're investing in roads, bridges, airports, public transit, water systems, high-speed rail, so much more. In Maricopa County in Arizona, we helped build a new bridge over the, uh, over the, over the Holly River. Look, in, in Warsaw, or excuse me, Washoe County in Nevada, we're spending $89 billion to add several lanes to the U.S. 395. In Maryland, Montgomery County, Prince George's County, replacing dirty diesel buses, which are bad for the health and the environment. With the leadership of Vice President Harris, we're partnering with your, you to deliver affordable high-speed internet to every single household, so no parent has to sit in the McDonald's parking lot, for God's sake, so their children can connect the internet to do their homework. <clears throat> We've already added 16 million more households to the affordable internet. We're just getting started. We're also making the biggest investment ever, ever in climate, through the Inflation Reduction Act, creating millions of good-paying jobs, investing in fence-line communities that have suffered the most as a consequence of being smothered by pollution. Think of Cancer Alley in Louisiana, or as the Delaware delegation can tell you, Route 9 in Delaware. They're going to be the first ones to benefit. We passed the Chips and Science Act, which has led to a commitment of over $300 billion, $300 billion in private investment in manufacturing. We're opening factories in your states to build semiconductor chips and electric vehicles and advanced batteries that's going to power those vehicles. In my first two years in office, we've created 800,000 manufacturing jobs. Where in the hell is it written to say we can't lead the world of manufacturing again? Where does it say that? For decades, we imported projects and exported jobs because cheaper jobs overseas. A lot of companies left. How many of you come from areas where you used to have a factory of four or 500 people and everything got lost? They just picked up and took off overseas. What happens? It leaves the community devastated. They lose hope. How many of you have heard someone say to you, well, my daughter came up to me and said, I can't live here anymore, Mom. There's no jobs. I got to move. Now America is exporting products and creating jobs at home. Today, today's report on inflation shows the good news is that inflation in America is continuing to come down. It's fallen seven straight months. There's more to go. Food prices at the grocery store are coming down. Gas prices are down $1.60 since their peak. Real wages for working Americans are up over the last several months. The living, welcome, breathing room. Melissa, my dad would say, all I'm looking for, Joey, is just a little breathing room at the end of the month. It's a little breathing room. Have a little bit left over after I paid all my bills. We're seeing this progress 
even as unemployment remains at a 50-year low. We're going to have bumps in the road still. There's still more work to do as we make this transition more steady, more stable growth. And there could be setbacks along the way. That's why my unwavering focus is on continuing to lower costs for families, rebuild our supply chains, invest in America. Today's data reinforces what we have made historic progress, and we're on the right track. And now we need to finish the job. We're building the economy from the bottom up and the middle out. So every county across America, not just as works on cost and the coast-to-coast -coast areas, but in the heartland. My plan, I refer to as a blue-collar blueprint to rebuild America. We're creating good jobs you can raise a family on. And most don't require a college degree. Jobs that people don't have to leave home in search of opportunity. Let me just give you a few examples. Intel is going to invest $20 billion on 1,000 acres outside of Columbus, Ohio, that I refer to as a field of dreams. They're going to build two fabs, they call them, factories that manufacture semiconductors, which, by the way, the semiconductors were invented in America. You got it? Invented in America. Now we're, we used to have 40 percent of the world's chips manufacturing. We're down to 10 percent because we forgot. Not anymore. Intel's going to create 7,000 jobs building in that field of dreams, 3,000 working on the fabs, 4,000 building the facilities. The average salary in one of those factories is going to be roughly $130,000 a year. And you don't need a college degree. You don't need a college degree for that. <clears throat> That's building America from the bottom up and the middle out. But there's 30, $300 billion being invested. And now we're doing all this and so much more while cutting the deficit more than $1.7 trillion in two years, the largest deficit reduction in American history in my first two years in office. <laughs> largest. You may have seen the spirit of debate in my State of the Union address. <laughs> it was kind of fascinating. I felt like I was back in a playground. Some of my Republican friends in Congress, not all of them, but some of them, have been threatening to hold your economy hostage if we don't cut Medicare and Social Security. When I called them out on this in the State of the Union, it sounded as though they agreed right then and there to take those cuts off the table. I sure hope so. If that's true, I'll believe it when I see it, but I hope that's true. That's also when we see whether or not we're going to plan to cut Medicaid and other programs critical to people. Most of you have finally reached the point where your revenues are climbing and your budgets are stable, most of you. And so I know that I, you share my concern that some in Congress are putting that progress at risk by threatening to have America default on its debt, which would be catastrophic for counties and the country. In fact, even coming close to default will raise borrowing costs make it harder to finance key projects in your communities. Ironically, nearly 25 percent of the entire national debt, which took 200 years to accumulate — so the national debt is 200 years old — accumulated over that period of time. 25 percent of that debt was added in the previous four years of the last administration. 25 percent of the 200 years of debt. So I met with the Speaker of the House, who's a decent guy. He's got a tough job. He made it real clear to me what he wants to do. He says he's not going to raise taxes in it at all on anybody, and he just wants to cut programs. So I suggested instead of making threats about the debt ceiling, we would, which would be catastrophic, let's just lay out our budgets. I'll lay out mine on March the 9th, exactly what I want to spend, who gets taxed, who doesn't get taxed, who gets — what programs get cut, what programs get added. And he should do the same. We can sit down and go — I mean it sincerely — go over it, see what they want to cut, see what we want to cut. But here's the thing. If you add up the proposal that my Republican friends in Congress have offered so far, just so far now, legislation, they would add another $3 trillion to our debt over the next 10 years. Let me be specific. Here's how they do it. They made it clear in legislation introduced to 
the, uh, the investment we've made to crack down on tax cheats, billionaires and millionaires. The CBO says by doing away with that, that, those extra agents, we're going to cost the American public another $114 billion in lost revenue. They finally have made Medicare negotiate the drug prices. Well, they want to repeal that. They want to repeal the prescription drug savings and increase subsidies to big pharma. Right now, for the first time in history, and I've been trying to do this for over 30 years, we pay the highest prescription drug cost of any nation in the world. Any nation in the world. No one else is close. So what did we do? We passed a law that said that in order to be able to, the Medicare, which pays billions of dollars in Medicare bills for everybody, Medicare should be able to negotiate drug price. Say, we will only pay you so much for that drug if you want to sell the drug to the Medicare to give to people. Well, guess what? It passed. Now, if that gets cut, And by the way, you know, it's like, you know, when we, when we talked about this bill being passed, everybody said, yeah, and a promise that we're going to bring down drug prices and insulin. How many of you know somebody who has, has diabetes and needs insulin? Yeah, a lot of you do, a lot of people. Well, guess what? Those folks who need it, including 200,000 kids, are paying somewhere between four and $600 a month. You know what they're paying now as of the 1st of January? $35. And we're not cheating anybody. You know how much it costs to make that drug? $10. Package is another two. It was invented over 100 years ago. The man who invented it didn't even want to put a patent on it because he wanted to make it available to everybody. Well, guess what? It's coming down. Guess what's going to happen? This year, the total amount of cost of the drugs you have to pay for that you need is now $3,800. Next year, it'll be 2000 you say, what difference does that make, Joe? Who has those kind of bills? Anybody like my family, you know what, how much cancer drugs cost? Ten, twelve, fourteen thousand dollars a year. Nobody on Medicare will have to pay more than two thousand dollars a year for all the drugs they consume. <laughs> Nobody. And guess what that's doing? That's saving the taxpayers, $159 billion a year. That's they're paying that much less out to Medicare recipients. Well, folks, you take that away, it raises the deficit, $159 billion. <clears throat> we passed the law to make sure <clears throat> corporations pay at least 15% tax. Now, I come from the corporate capital of the world, Delaware. No, not joking. More corporations are incorporated in Delaware than every other state in America combined. The idea, for example, one of the reasons I was able to cut the deficit as was I was able to do and have these programs available was simple. We said the, 15, the 55 corporations of the Fortune 500 who made $40 billion in 2020 had to pay at least a 15% tax. That's less than a nurse pays, a police officer, a street cleaner. Well, guess what? It allowed us to pay for all this, 15%. And like I said, if you're a cop, you're paying 10% more than that. Look, we want to, they want to repeal, again, that tax. They want to repeal a corporate minimum tax, which is 15%. If they do that, that'll add $222 billion of the deficit to repeal what we passed. They want to repeal the 1% surcharge for stock buybacks. And let me explain most, I didn't know years ago what a stock buyback was. Well, it was a simple proposition. If in fact you, one of the big mistakes I made as a U.S. Senator, and it was well intended, like a lot of things, like the nuns you say, I mean, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. <laughs> well, you know, one of the good intentions I voted with Bill Clinton, who's still a good friend, to say that no corporate man and no corporate president could make more than a million dollars 
from the profit of their from from the corporation they ran. Well, that incentivized everybody to get paid by to, by stock by stock buybacks. So 90, I think it's 91 percent of all corporate execs are paid by in stock. Well, what's the one way to increase your salary? Buy back your stock. It raises the price of the stock, raises the value, <clears throat> and the shareholders and you do well. But guess what? <clears throat> you end up not investing in the uh, on the thing you're engaged in. For example, corporate America. You had the oil companies. You know how much they made in profit this year? Two hundred billion dollars in the middle of an energy crisis because they bought back their stock, and they're not investing in refineries, repairing them, or maintaining them. Now, they're saying, and that's a legitimate argument they make, they say, Biden, you want to go all, uh, you, you want to go green, and in 10 years we won't need this. Well, guess what? We're going to need oil for a long time, and gas for a long time. It's not going to go all go away. But they're, look at all the refineries that are closed, because they're not investing in the nature of the business they're involved in, is one example. And so what did we do? We added a percent tax on a stock buyback. If you eliminate that, it's going to cost $74 billion more in the deficit. They want to extend the Trump tax cuts from the previous four years, which cost $2.7 trillion in the deficit. Extend it. And guess who gets it? You all don't. The point is this. I believe we can be fiscally responsible without res threatening to send our country into chaos. I believe it because we've been doing it. When I introduce a budget three weeks from now, a few weeks from now, May, May, I guess March 9th, well, you're going to see we'll cut the deficit by another $2 trillion in the next 10 years. And I'll lay it out in detail. But here's the bottom line. I'm simply not going to let the nation default on its debt for the first time in history. America is a nation that's paid its bill for the last 200 years. And over the past two years, we've passed historic amounts of significant legislation that actually grow the economy, increase jobs, increase access to health care, reduce the cost of prescription drugs. We're on our way to building the best infrastructure in the world again. But as all of you know, the work doesn't stop here. So let's finish the job. I'm really optimistic for the year ahead as we implement the laws we've already passed, if we didn't pass another single thing, the things that are going to take place by implementing just the laws we passed last year are going to deliver real benefits to people that they're going to feel in their everyday lives. Just like people now understand, since Inflation Reduction Act was passed, seniors are only going to pay 35 bucks for a prescription of insulin. We're seeing the effects. It's going to change people's lives. This is the work we're going to continue to do together, Democrats and Republicans, and we're proving in every county in America our best days are ahead of us. They're not behind us. This is the United States of America, for God's sake. There's nothing. I mean this sincerely. There's nothing we can't do. We're the only nation in the world that's come out of every crisis we've ever met stronger than we went into it. The only nation that's ever done that. We're the only nation in the world because we have a resilient population. America never gives up, never steps down, never backs away, never stops. I mean it. We have an incredible country, and there's nothing beyond our capacity if we do it together, and we're looking to the counties to be the key to getting it done. God bless you all. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And may God protect our troops.